famous American comedian, Groucho Marx, once perceptively remarked that he would not wish to join any club that would accept him as a member. It's a sentiment I can appreciate, which possibly explains why I myself am not a member of any club. But I'm the exception because clubs have always been a part of the British way of life overseas. And wherever they ventured on the face of the globe during their empire building days, they took their clubs with them. The first club in Singapore was formed in 1825 and it bore the same name as this illustrious hotel. It was called the Raffles Club. It was actually more of an entertainment committee than a real club. The first real club was all about this. A billiard club, though you probably noticed, were in fact playing snooker. Or at least one of us is. Originally a pastime enjoyed exclusively by the British and other European settlers, but over the past 180 years, everyone else has become rather good at it as well. Pioneer merchant Edward Bowsted formed the first billiard club in 1829. It only lasted one year, but it set the ball rolling, and a lot more clubs were to follow. Mr. Bowsted, in fact, was later to build the Bowsted Institute. It provided accommodation for British sailors waiting in between employment on ships, as well as offering a club-like atmosphere with recreational activities and facilities. In 1862, British merchants like Mr. Edward Bowsted formed what could be described as a businessmen's club and located it in the Chamber of Commerce building at the mouth of the Singapore River. They called their creation the Singapore Club and it kept its same address when in 1928 a far more familiar structure took over the site. This was the Fullerton building which has recently become the plushly appointed Fullerton Hotel. As well as being the home of the Singapore Club, the General Post Office was located on its ground floor, and Julian's off on a side trip to visit where he used to buy his postage stamps, a very different place today. The original post office counter, which stretched the full length of this room, has been replaced by a bar. The marvellous Art Deco ceilings and columns have been preserved really is a fabulous space. Julian might no longer be able to airmail a letter back to his mum in England from here, but if he stayed on another few hours, he'd certainly be able to buy a meal that wouldn't disappoint him, and doubtless a refreshing liquid libation too. The aptly named Post Bar occupies the historical site, and as Julian mentioned, does so with respect to its original architectural features. Of course, there's some striking new additions, much as one might expect in its new role. However, the splendid old post office is more of a personal sentimental journey than what we're really here to see, and that's the Singapore Club. Captains of commerce, after a long, hard day of making money, used to come here to relax together in the evenings and to talk about ways to make even more money. So things back then possibly weren't all that different to now, were they? And this is where it all happened. This is the only area surviving today of the original Singapore Club, and it's undeniably impressive. In here, perhaps 10,000 deals were made, whilst 10,000 games were played, and the game of choice was billiards. The colony clearly had a long and enduring love affair with this particular pastime. The Singapore Club, a very exclusive institution. I doubt whether they would have let me through the doors. All too true, Julian. Creativity and commerce back then were distant bedfellows, so best you move on before there's a ghostly complaint or two about your talents on the keyboard. To qualify for membership at the old Singapore Club, you would have had to have at least been a millionaire, a company director, or a very highly placed civil servant. That's three strikes, so I think you're out.
The Singapore club was very fussy about whom it would accept as members. This attitude not only applied to businessmen's clubs, but to sporting ones as well. And it must be admitted that their rules weren't entirely sporting. The Singapore Cricket Club, indeed like most sports associations, confined their membership to whites only. So in response to this, the Eurasian community formed its own sports association, the Singapore Recreation Club. They built a modest clubhouse, but did so in a tantalizingly challenging position. The Padang had been a sports field since the settlement's early years, and the cricket club had been a pioneer occupant. However, they now found themselves confronted with the Singapore Recreation Club at its opposite end. Of the many cricket matches played between these two traditional sports rivals, it must be admitted that the Singapore Recreation Club won more games than they lost. However, the Recreation Club had rules of exclusion of their own. Theirs was like most, a men's only club, and it wasn't until 1931 that a ladies toilet was provided. The first time ladies were even permitted to enter the SRC clubhouse. In the decades following World War II, changing times meant changing rules, and both the Recreation Club and the Cricket Club opened their memberships to everyone. The Singapore Cricket Club still boasts a clubhouse that's an architectural treasure, a national heritage site par excellence. And the Singapore Recreation Club will courteously refrain from comment except to say that their original clubhouse was most attractive. Not everyone amongst the colony's European community based their clubs around sporting activities. The Germans, for instance, rather like getting together and singing national songs. And with this end in mind, they formed the Teutonia Club in 1859. In 1900, they built a splendid new clubhouse in Scots Road. This was designed by the renowned architect R.A.J. Bidwell, who was also the gentleman who was responsible for designing the fabulous Raffles Hotel just the year before. You'll no doubt recognise the Teutonia Club as the Goodwood Park Hotel, and the management should be congratulated for preserving this historical site. At that time, the German and British communities were on excellent terms with one another. And so whilst the new Teutonia Club was under construction, a nearby British club graciously offered its members temporary use of their facilities. And the Germans' kindly benefactor was none other than the prestigious Tangling Club, but all this walking about sure is hot work. So after the break, I think we'll drop by a swimming pool. The Singapore Swimming Club was formed in the early 1890s, when the beachfront was a mere 100 metres from this very spot on Tanjong Ru Road. Their first clubhouse was a small atap hut rented from a Malay fisherman. So things have clearly improved from a century ago. Now, I literally haven't been inside this place for over 40 years. But funny enough, I can remember this dark passageway and the changing rooms were on either side and there were ornamental goldfish ponds. And it led through to the main swimming pool area. So let's go and take a look. Well, the old place has changed so much that I'm fortunate to have my friend Victor here who's going to tell me something about the club. Yes, um, on this ground where we walk, actually, uh, this was the only pool we had before. Uh, I joined the club about 1971, around there, you know? Really? And we used to have three diving boards here. <coughs> yes, I remember, because I used to be a member as a child and they were yeah. beautiful. We took the diving board out for safety reasons, you see? Because right. uh, there was a case somewhere in Singapore where somebody got hurt, you know, really? and his spine behind and become paralysed for a long, long time. Now, now if, if I remember correctly, the, the, the land stopped here and there was a beach. Yeah, that's, and right. The that's right. It stops here and there's no pool there. Right. And there was a beach over the other side, you know. Yes. And all this was upgraded, you know, 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Again. Even yes. this building, all these that you see, yes. they were all gigantic. We don't have them before. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would say that the club is in super shape now. 
if you ask me, it's practically my first home. Really? So I'm always here. Yeah, right. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you, look for me here. I can imagine. Yeah, I would recommend people to come. It's Splendid. the best club. <laughs> really? That's why I know it's one of the best clubs. And, and I think in the old days, I, I regret to say, it was rather elitist. It was British only, oh, not yeah, open yeah, yeah. to Singaporeans. In, in, in the old days, uh, it was run all by the British. Yeah. And uh, no local, you can't join at the right. moment. And I think it's after independence, you know? Yes, Maybe that around figures. the mid. 60 or what? Yeah. Then we start to take in local and all that. Right. Like I say, I myself joined in 1971, you see? Right. So I have a rough idea of the club. And we used to have <coughs> uh, a store there selling these uh, ice kachang ice and kachang, all that. Yes, Those uh, olden day machines. Well, I, I remember that, and I'm there. sure. And that yes. was very nice. And we have a store of ice cream parlor along here. Yes. And remember, we had to use cheats and all that to buy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No money, just all. Yeah, it was very exciting and very signing, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Even when I came to join in 1971, I had a, a British to sign for me to come in right. during those times. Yeah, yeah. to be sponsored to join. Sponsored the club. to join the club. That's right. Yeah. It was a small, cozy, and nice place. But mm -hmm. today, of course, it has expanded. Well, I would say very gigantic. Yeah. And you ask me personally, I say it's a very good club to join. Yeah. One of the best. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, the most famous story about the Singapore Swimming Club is the one about the woman who was taken by a shark. She was a club member. Her name was Miss Boya Smith. And in some accounts, it was her 18th birthday, which makes the story all the more poignant. Anyway, in those days, there was no swimming pool. There was just the sea. And there was a diving platform a few yards off the shore. Miss Boya Smith dived into the water and was immediately set upon by a shark who made off with one of her legs. There was a brave chap on the platform with her and he dived in and recovered her and brought her ashore but sadly she died there and then on the beach. In one account it is said that she actually uttered a scream before she hit the water which would rather seem to suggest that she'd seen the shark there down below her but by that time it was too late. She'd made her dive and there was nothing she could do about it. The famous shark incident reminds me of a rather similar story I heard from a friend who got it from his mother. Again, it took place here at Tanjung Ru, and again, it involved a young woman who lost one of her legs, this time to a crocodile. It was in the 1930s, and she was sunbathing on the beach and was reading a book or otherwise lost in thought, when suddenly a huge, great estuarine crocodile emerged from the waves, slithered across the sand, and bit clean through one of her legs. Happily on this occasion, the young woman didn't die, but she became something of a celebrity, hobbling around Singapore on her crutches. It was a highly unlikely event to imagine then, and almost impossible to conceive nowadays. Further down the coast at Katong, the Chinese swimming club was more fortunate and didn't suffer members or visitors being troubled by estuarine crocodiles or voracious sharks. However, like the SSC, the Chinese Swimming Club lost their beachfront location to land reclamation, so adequately compensated by expanding and improving their pool facilities. You find me in Club Street in the middle of Chinatown. Now, in the old days, this used to be jam-packed with uh, clan associations and recreational clubs of one sort or another, hence the name, Club Street. Now, you may have thought that the Germans had really gone to town with their Teutonia Club, but there are actually some very fine buildings here in Club Street, which I find one of the most interesting streets, architecturally speaking, left in Chinatown. Like the Teutonia, many of these recreational clubs here in Club Street were devoted to the pursuit of musical activities. So it must have been rather nice to wander down here of an evening and hear the dulcet tones of an erwu issuing forth from an open window or doorway. Clan associations played an important part in the lives of newly arrived immigrants from China in the 19th century. They gave them a place to sleep, helped them find jobs, and so forth. But they continued to be a focus of social activities right into the middle of the 20th century. I remember my old black and white armor who was from Guangzhou. On her days off, she used to come down to her clan association or Kongsi and play mahjong and meet up with her friends and that sort of thing. But you'd be hard pressed to find a club in Club Street these days. Nor will you find here at Hong Lim Park 
any evidence of another famous sports association, that of the Straits Chinese Recreation Club. In the centre of what was once called Hong Lim Green used to stand their clubhouse. However, the park and its surroundings have undergone considerable change and the Straits Chinese Recreation Club's pretty building is long forgotten. If you search carefully, you can still find a few splendid old Chinese clubs remaining, but they're becoming fewer by the year. The preference for modern air-conditioned steel glass and concrete boxes has sadly seen an end to the traditional Chinese clubhouses of yesteryear. Julian's on the move again, and we're catching up with him here in Northbridge Road opposite St Andrew's Cathedral. On this site once stood the Union Jack Club, and there are no prizes for guessing the nationality of whom they catered for. Good afternoon, gentlemen. There were certainly hundreds of clubs about over the past century and a half. Clubs for every one and everything. However, Julian's off not to another, but instead to one of the settlement's very first social gathering places. In the early days of the settlement, and I'm thinking here of the 1840s or thereabouts, people used to dine quite early in the afternoon, around 4.30, and then they'd put on their best clothes and finery, and they'd come down here to the Padang and drive around in their carriages or ponies and traps, or take a walk along the esplanade, a promenade along the esplanade. Because, of course, in those days, the sea came up to here. But where I'm standing was called Scandal Point, it was a place where people would congregate of an evening to enjoy the sea breezes and where sharp tongues were quick to crucify anyone that was deemed a suitable target. Perhaps they'd been seen in the wrong company or they'd said rather too much after a whiskey or three. And in the absence of any real scandal, rumour and innuendo were sufficient to create some. Yes, back in the mid-19th century, Scandal Point was aptly named and a dangerous place to be. A rather less dangerous but equally appropriately named institution used to stand round about here until a few years ago. Like Scandal Point, it was more of a meeting place than a formal organisation as such, but it was nonetheless named the Sasse Club. And again, it originally stood beside the sea, which was rather nice, but then land reclamation removed the lapping of the waves and with them went some of the charm of the old place. Eventually it petered out altogether, no more than about 12 or 13 years ago, I think. It's recently been reborn down by the river, but not quite the same thing, I think. At one time, the Safi Club was actually located rather closer to Raffles Hotel, more or less on the site of that building over there, which, as it happens, is another social club. In its most recent incarnation, it was a clubhouse for non-commissioned officers in the Singapore Armed Forces. Before that, it was a club for British officers. In those days, it was known as the Shackles Club, which raises rather interesting questions as to precisely what went on in there. Be that as it may, let's bring this programme to conclusion by taking a look at another British club, which is in fact called The British Club. It's somewhat ironic that despite only being established about 20 years ago, the British Club has recreated a European ambience that's becoming less evident in Singapore's older and more historical clubs. Well, we, uh, we like to present the best of British. We are uh, British ambiance. We have an international membership, many uh, Singaporeans, local members, and uh, I believe members from about 40 countries, from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, all over the world. Uh, and many of them, most of them join the club because they like this uh, British ambiance to it, this yes. feel of uh, what we term in our 
marketing quintessentially British, which doesn't mean a little England isolated from everywhere else. It means the best things of Britain, whether it's the culture, the ceremonies, the things like the changing of the guard, the yeah. things that uh, uh, Singaporeans in particular would enjoy when they go to visit uh, UK, the, the famous sights and sounds, and right. we, uh, in, in many aspects, try and have this quintessentially British, the best bits of Britain. Yes. We found that a lot of our local members uh, join because they like this sort of ambiance, yeah. and they don't want us to change into something different. Well, I believe a couple of pints and a game of billiards are in order. So whilst you take a look and see what's on next week's programme, we shall prepare ourselves. And I believe I'm on top form tonight. In next week's programme, from distant places, many races, Julian investigates Arabic, Eurasian and Jewish contributions to what makes the nation tick over so splendidly. And he's visiting some places most of you won't have seen before. Pretty spectacular stuff, I promise you. These ethnic minorities are the salt in the soup of Singapore, and what they've given us is impressive to say the least. Next week on Sight and Sound. 170 years have elapsed since the first billiards and snooker room was established in Singapore. And during that time, Singapore has changed enormously. The game of billiards, on the other hand, has not changed one iota. And neither has my game, it seems, which has remained just about the same dismal level as when I first started playing back in about 1967. <laughs> but I, for one, am glad to come across this little patch of green bays. A little corner of a foreign field, one might say, that is forever England. I'm reliably informed that winning isn't everything, but just once, it would be nice. Until next week, your good health. Pioneer merchant Edward Bowster. Oh, sorry, I got stuck, my hand got stuck in the pocket. Not everyone amongst the... Ah, okay, okay, okay. In this instance, in this instance, no, they gave them a place to sleep, helped them find uh, com <laughs> But here in Club Street, there are actually some very fine buildings as well. No, it's actually a wrong line. I, didn't, I can't even read my writing. That's the trouble. <laughs>